Welcome to Everything Change, Cloiso Inewid Popith, 10 days of talks, conversations, readings and performances about creativity and adaptive thinking in response to the climate and ecological crises. When it comes to drastically reducing emissions of greenhouse gases and protecting biodiversity, we largely know and have known for a long time what we have to do. The challenge facing us now, therefore, is perhaps more one of the imagination than of action. How might we, as individuals, nations, as species, imagine a different way of being on this planet? How might we imagine a fairer, healthier future for ourselves, our children, and the natural world upon which we rely to survive? How might creativity across the arts, sciences, business, law, policy, activism, education, help make that future feel not just vital, but possible? These are some of the questions that we'll be exploring in Everything Change through artistic provocations, events with two of the world's leading writers, and seven interdisciplinary conversations across seven crucial areas of change. Money, food, water, energy, justice, story, and change itself. From retreating glaciers and melting ice caps to rising sea levels and the acidification of the oceans, it is in the stories of water that the consequences of our warming world are perhaps most clearly told. So what is the future for our relationship with water in a world where for some there will be too much and for others never enough? And where might water offer us hope as a new source of energy, carbon capture or sustainable farming? Thank you for joining us for another Everything Change panel discussion chaired by lawyer, human rights activist and author Faustina Pereira as we dive into the oceans and rivers of the world to explore the challenges and the possibilities of its changing water. And welcome to this session on changing water, which is part of the Everything Change series of events. The area that we are going to discuss today and hopefully have a deep dive in is a matter of our very existence. It involves the resources that we wish to have access to, but it is also our right to a basic need. But what are the challenges around this basic need? How do we define and refine our right to it? And what are the tools for advocacy around it? These and many other issues are which we will go into today, hopefully in some detail. I have a stellar panel uh, who will be taking us into some of the challenges and hopefully uh, the prospects around water. Before I have the pleasure of introducing my panel, I would like to invite you all to enjoy a perhaps a uh, uh, provocation, an artistic provocation, which will be shared with us by the very talented uh, Vikram Ayangar, who I will be introducing in greater detail uh, very shortly. This artistic provocation will provide the background, uh, which will lead us into some of the more intricate details of the issue at a discussion today. So without further ado, uh, we start with our first artistic provocation by Vikram Ayangar. Ninety-eight, ninety-six, eighty, sixty. 
The corpse is spoke in one voice. All is well. Sab kuch changa changa. O king, in your ideal realm, the hearse is now the Ganga. Upche uthe shoshan, moshan, puri diye kaat. Shunno kore uthon, morai bhure chhe shomat. Naat chhe udo mrittu duti, baad chhe moron longka. Raja, tumar Ram Rajje. Shop Bahini Gonga Raj Tamari Dug Dug Dunti Chimni Poro Mange Raj Amari Chudli Fute Dardar Chati Bange Murtu Joy Fidel Vagade Bahre Billa Ranga Raj Tamara Ram Rajema Shab Bahini Ganga. King, your clothes are divine. Divine is your radiance. Raja Shajer Bhoro, the town entire sees you in your true form. Raj Tamara Divya Divya Tamari Jyoti. Raj Tamane Asli Raji Nagri Jyoti. The Emperor has no clothes. Raja Mera Nanga. Okay. In your ideal realm, the hearse is now the Ganga. With that artistic provocation as the backdrop to our discussion, I now have the pleasure of inviting our panel today. I will introduce our panel in the order in which they will be speaking. First, Sabrina Mafuz, who is a writer and performer, raised in London and in Cairo. She is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and resident writer at Shakespeare's Globe Theatre. Her most recent theatre show was A History of Water in the Middle East. And her most recent publications as editor include Smashing It, Working Class Artists on Life, Art and Making It Happen, and Poems from a Green and Blue Planet. Welcome, Sabrina. Next, I have the pleasure of welcoming again Vikram Ayangar, whose artistic provocation we have just watched, and who I'm sure will come back and help elaborate on it 
perhaps it's metaphors, perhaps uh, it's greater relevance and impact. But of course, I understand, uh, Vikram, it is open to interpretation. And it would be lovely, perhaps in the Q&A section, for attendees uh, to, to come back with their interpretation of it. So Vikram Iyengar is a, an arts leader and connector, and he is now based in India, uh, Calcutta in India. However, he works internationally. He is a dancer, choreographer, director, curator, presenter, and an arts researcher and writer. Co-founder and artistic director of Raman, Ranan Performance Collective. He has also initiated and leads the Pickle Factory Dance Foundation a hub for dance and movement practice and discourse. His scope of work spans practice, discourse, critique, ideation and management, and revolves around the central tenet of creating deep connections with and through the arts. Welcome once again, Vietram. I then have the pleasure of uh, Introducing and welcoming to the panel, Dr. Aaron Thierry, who is an academic and climate activist, an ecologist by training who studied permafrost thaw in Arctic Canada. He went on to co-found the Climate Action Group, Scientists for Extinction Rebellion. He is currently studying for his second PhD, looking at climate emergency communications at Cardiff University. Welcome, Dr. Thierry. And last but certainly not least, I have the pleasure to welcome Dr. Salim ul Haq, who is the director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development, and who is also a professor at Independent University of Bangladesh. He is an associate of the International Institute on Environment and Development, based in the United Kingdom. He has published hundreds of scientific as well as popular articles and has been recognized as one of the top 20 global influences on climate change policy in 2019 and a top scientist from Bangladesh on climate change science. He is an expert in adaptation to climate change in the most vulnerable developing countries and has been a lead author of the third, fourth and fifth assessment reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Dr. Salim ul -Haq, welcome to this panel. What I have asked each of you is, and I hope you will um, be able to take, certainly myself and also the audience present here today, into what, from your perspective, is the most, or are the most significant issues of challenge regarding water. For example, as a, as a human rights lawyer, my particular focus and interest is around uh, water justice or right to water. Um, and I'm sure attendees uh, coming from different perspectives have uh, various uh, perspectives and angles uh, from which they would like to approach this, this topic of water. Uh, its use, its abuse, its uh, advocacy around it, uh, it and activism around it. So how do we approach the greatest challenges around it? And what to you would be perhaps two or three takeaways in terms of the most exciting and creative solutions and responses that you would like to provide? Um, for attendees, I would like to invite you to feel free to um, send in your questions, uh, comments and observations in the chat box depending on the number of questions and of course the complexity and the time involved uh, or that we have remaining, I would be uh, as efficient as, as I can to direct the questions to the relevant uh, panelists. So without further ado, I have the pleasure of welcoming uh, Sabrina Mahfouz and inviting her to start with her artistic provocation and uh, the opening remarks through her artistic provocations, which will lead the other panelists today. The floor Thanks. is yours. Thanks, Athena, and um, everybody, hello. Um, so my opening statement and artistic provocation are interwoven into the next um, six minutes or so. 
Um, just as a, as a bit of an introduction, um, in 2019, I wrote and performed a play called A History of Water in the Middle East at the Royal Court Theatre in London. Um, and it came about after many years of research and, and various other pieces of work that I'd done. Um, and it culminated in this because I really wanted to look at the British imperial presence in the Middle East, not just historically, but also presently. And specifically how the region's water resources sparked, enabled and continues um, that presence today and how it impacts everything, um, including women's rights, violence against women and strategies for climate crisis mitigation. Um, and I suppose my provocation is that any strategy aiming to combat water scarcity or management in, in that region particularly, but it could be applied um, to many other regions across the world, um, need to take colonisation into account as a fundamental aspect of planning within that. Um, so this is a short extract from, from the section of the show that focused on Yemen. Um, sorry about my hay fever and my nasally delivery, um, but instead of a musician accompanying me, this is what we have. Yemen. In 2019, the UN declares it as suffering the worst man-made humanitarian crisis in all of history. 22 million require aid. 100,000 children under five have died of starvation. These lines drawn by greed, impatience and ego on who needs to go home early to say sorry for their infidelity. So can we just draw the line? Can we just get on with it? Because there's not much to it, is there? There's not much more that we're doing here than just drawing a line in the godforsaken sand, is there? This is where they lead. Lockheed Martin, British American arms manufacturer, makes a bomb that in 2018 kills 40 Yemeni boys on a bus coming back from school. 180 years ago, in 1839, British forces forcibly occupied Aden at the tip of what is now Yemen in order to launch attacks on the pirates attacking British ships bound to and from India. It became convenient for refueling and after the Suez Canal opening, it became one of the most important ports in all the world, to the British, of course. An importance based completely on water, empire, untouchable power, an importance that took away any independence, any consequence of concentrating all resources to a port before you leave and then. By 2022, Sana'a, the capital of Yemen, is set to become the first place in the world to completely run out of fresh water. But Yemen had lush arable areas even as a water scarce country before this current war. But Saudi and UAE and USA and UK and Yemen and Russia and Qatar and Sudan and Morocco and Kuwait and Iraq and Senegal and Jordan and Bahrain and Hezbollah and Al-Qaeda and Al-Haraq and whoever else is involved in attack in part due to access over that old friend of ours, the Suez Canal, have chosen water as a form of murder. Smash the pipes, bomb the salination tanks, cut the supplies, watch them choke of cholera and thirst more and more and more water poor does not mean it has all been spent, but that the wealth has been taken away. 98% of Yemeni women are thought to have been sexually assaulted during this four year drawn out conflict. Where will they wash themselves? Will they scrub with sand grains until they regain the glass hours they've lost to lines drawn by lords, made into marble statues, soaked with rain, engraved with their names for all of time whilst these women can't even find the graves of their children, can't rid their skin of intrusion, intrusion, invasion, intervention, all the same old war and no amount of water can wash it away. This is an old, old war. Blame us for the drought, blame us for the thunder, blame us for the waves taking us all under. Burn us for your palace, burn us for your crown, burn us for our bodies, taking us all down. We carry history on our shoulders, we carry history in our hearts. We've carried ourselves over mountains to end up drowning in the sea. This is an old, old war. So blame us for the drought, 
Blame us for the thunder. Blame us for the waves taking us all under. This is an old, old war. Powerful, powerful, absolutely. Thank you, Sabrina, for that artistic and poetic perspective. And um, I was really touched by the line that we carry history on our shoulders and in our hearts. And hopefully what we are doing today is going to take us from history into the future and how we use the resources that we have been given. So thank you once again. And with that artistic provocation, I would like to move on to the other artists on our panel, Vikram Ayangar. If you could come in and perhaps share your uh, you know, artistic perspective on how you approach this whole issue of highly existential resource, water. Thank you, Vikram. Thanks so much. And thank you, Sabrina, for that poem. It's just an incredibly powerful, um, when you say this is an old, old war, I'm thinking around water in particular. And um, when I was asked to think of a provocation in response to water, I immediately thought of rivers. Um, I live in Calcutta. It's the last um, major city on the banks of the um, Indian branch of the Ganges before it flows into the sea uh, in, the, in the huge delta, which is also one of the most ecologically fragile uh, places on the planet. Um, and um, in Calcutta, there is, uh, um, there is a potter's colony called Kumar Tuli in the north of the city, which is on the banks of the river. And um, this is where um, the silt and mud from the river is brought up to make the many idols that we use in our, in our various Hindu festivals in Calcutta and Bengal in particular. It's mainly uh, goddesses, very few gods in our, in our practice of Hinduism. And our main uh, festival being the Mother Goddess Festival. And the silt is brought up from this river, the images are made, uh, the festivities are concluded, and then the images go back into the river in um, ceremony of um, immersion. Um, so there is this sort of uh, cyclical relationship that we have with, with the river in particular, not just water, but the rivers in particular, um, which is uh, something that is very, very maybe particular to Hinduism. Uh, all our rivers are named, uh, they, they are deified, they are goddesses, um, and they are carriers of, of um, purity, they are carriers of purification, they are symbols of um, cleansing, not just the body, but the soul and the mind and the spirit. Um, so when I was thinking of the film, I was thinking of this relationship between the body being a dancer and the water, so the solid of the body and the liquid of the water. But this solid form is made up of 60 to 70 percent water, depending on what part of the body you're looking at. Um, so what is that relationship between the fluid and the solid is one of the things I looked at. And what is the relationship between us and rivers, the human body and rivers, especially living in India? Um, and as I said, um, all our rivers are deified. And the, the Sanskrit uh, uh, lyric that you hear in the background of, of the film is, is, a, is a chant, a very old chant, which... Um, basically talks of uh, the Ganga, the Ganges River as, um, as, as, a, as, a, as a symbol of purity, as, some, as, as a force that purifies, that cleanses um, through her merciful waves. Um, and really along all our rivers from the source right to the, mouth, right to the mouth, there are all of these rituals and festivals that are happening, um, especially along the banks of the Ganga. And one of the biggest is um, the Kumbh Mela, which happens in Haridwar every six years or 12 years, depending on what size of Kumbh you're looking at. And everyone now in the world knows that India has been really, really, really badly affected by the second wave of COVID. And we're still, I can't yet say that we're recovering from that, but we are going through that. And in March this year, when uh, the numbers were rising alarmingly, um, the government in their wisdom rather than looking at that, they actually preponed the Kumbh Mela by one entire year and allowed this huge religious gathering to happen on the banks of the river in Haridwar. And that really means millions of pilgrims gathering on this tiny little town that doesn't really have any infrastructure. So suddenly this, this ritual and celebration um, 
which is supposed to be life affirming. It's supposed to be celebrating divinity, supposed to be celebrating life and everything that's positive became this sort of death dealing um, congregation. Um, and um, not, not related to this, but as part of the COVID pandemic, the second wave here, we've had co diseased COVID bodies just thrown into the river and floating down the river. And the poem that you hear in, in my film is um, a translation of the, you hear the original Gujarati, then you hear the Bangla and the English of um, the Shabavahini Ganga, that the, that the Ganges has now become the carrier of these dead bodies. So what is this relationship that we have with the river? Um, where on the one hand, we um, have such a cultural, uh, historical, religious memory and connection with, with rivers, which is so respectful, so devout. Um, and on the other hand, in our daily practice, we are just treating it with complete disdain, uh, complete contempt, complete disrespect. We will take flowers to the river as an, act, as an offering. Um, and we will offer that. And the next minute we'll throw in the plastic packet that the flowers came, came in. And that's the sort of dichotomy and conundrum that really, that's the question I would like to propose. What is that schism in our own brains as people that we can have this really deep cultural connection and imagination of rivers as these powerful beings and then we do this. And it's not just what we do in our everyday life but what we've done to rivers across the country, whether it's through pollution, whether it's through damming, uh, it's just, they just cannot flow anymore. So what is it that we're doing? I really feel for the Ganga and where I live, um, from the source to the mouth, uh, the river's been carrying our sins for eons and eons. And now all the sins have got collected in the Sundarbans at the mouth of the river and there's nowhere for them to go. And I feel that it's coming back to haunt us and it's smacking us right back in the face. And that's what the river is telling us. So yeah, that's what I'd like to leave you with. Thank you. Vikram, thank you. You have left us with quite a few provocative uh, insights. I was particularly um, trying to imagine the, the push and pull. It's almost a self-destructive push and pull. On the one hand, how we deify rivers. And uh, I know a number of uh, courts in India have uh, well, the courts in India have identified a number of uh, your rivers as legal persons, as legal entities. In other words, um, assigning them a personage to protect themselves, being able to sue and be sued by others. Uh, and yet uh, there is this oppositional behavior existential as yet well as destructive. So I, I'm sure uh, during the question and answer, we will be able to come back to this, uh, this, uh, this point uh, uh, of our uh, the human behavior and why we do what we do and how we can overcome ourselves our, as our perhaps worst enemies. Thank you. Um, I would like to go on to Dr. Aaron Thierry now. And uh, if you would unmute yourself, Dr. Aaron, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, so, so yeah, both both very powerful um, and quite different from from what I'm going to do because I'm I'm here as the Earth System Scientist and uh, I'm going to think about it um, with my with my rationalist hat on. But um, when preparing these remarks, I, I went and did some research, and I think probably the easiest way to start summarizing um, just um, how important water is is to, to just read some of the headlines that I found. And these are all taken from just the last month. Uh, so they're all since mid-May. So on the 17th of May, it was reported in The Guardian that the Greenland ice sheet is on the brink of a major tipping point. Scientists say ice equivalent to one to two meters of sea level rise is probably already doomed to melt. On the 19th of May, the New York Times reported that severe drought has worsened uh, by climate change now ravages the American West. On the 27th of May, the Deccan Herald reported that West Bengal now sees five, a foot, five fold increase of cyclones in just 50 years. On the 2nd of June, The Guardian said that the climate crisis is now suffocating the world's lakes, a new study finds. Falling oxygen levels are harming already struggling wildlife and drinking water supplies, say scientists. 
on the 19th of June, uh, Down to Earth, a, a magazine in India says that gl glacier melting in the Hindu Kush uh, means that 2 billion people now may face food and water shortages by 2100. The Hindu Kush Himalayan mountain ranges could lose up to a third, uh, two thirds of the, their ice by 2100, according to this study by the UN uh, Environment Programme. On the 10th of June, the New Scientist reported that coral reefs may start dissolving faster uh, than they can grow by 2054. And uh, on the 12th of June, the Financial Times reported that China's sea level rise raises a threat to the economic hubs uh, to the extreme. And then today, the 15th of June, we see in Wales Online an article headlined, Wildfires Ripping Through Wales, Coal Tips Subsiding Into Storms, Massive Temperature Rises, The Bleak Future Wales Faces, based on a new report by the Committee on Climate Change. Peter Gleek, the famous uh, uh, climate scientist um, and water expert, has said that climate change is about water. It is water, uh, frozen water melting, that is the re reducing the ice caps. It is water evaporating from our soils uh, that causes the, uh, the, the droughts that wilt our crops. It is water inundating uh, from downpours our cities and uh, our, our fields and agricultural areas uh, that is uh, uh, resulting from climate change as precipitation becomes heavier. And it is water uh, from sea level rise that is salinating large areas of agricultural land and causing storm surges that flood coastal communities. We know that water is life, but this is what we're already seeing in terms of the impacts of water at just one degree Celsius of global warming. And we're headed to at least three degrees of global warming this century based on current uh, policies. Wales declared a planetary emergency in 2019 and said that they would take drastic action to fight the climate crisis. But you would be forgiven if you hadn't noticed. We know what an emergency response looks like the public just went through a massive public health emergency response in response to the coronavirus crisis. Where is that response to the climate crisis? If you look, listen to the words given by the G7 uh, uh, leaders that met in Cornwall just this week, they are leading us to a path of mass murder by willful neglect. And we, as citizens of these countries, are complicit in that mass murder unless we resist, unless we dissent, unless we rebel against it. We are heading now towards a future which I, I think is barbaric. A future of potentially um, you know we, we already hear the stories from Vikram and, and Sabrina about about the harm that's being done. Europe is militarizing its border across the Mediterranean as we speak. There are mass internment camps across North Africa where refugees are being held and prevented from leaving. Refugees from Bangladesh, from Syria, from Afghanistan, from across the Horn of Africa, who are leaving their homes because of the climate crisis and the impacts that are caused by our lifestyles here in the West. My ask, I guess, to you, my provocation, my hope, is that we can reimagine our own role, our own identities as agents for change in this time, as people who will challenge this authority that is taking us to our destruction, who will challenge our leaders who are willing to kill so many. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Aaron Theory. I I would go so far as to say that, um, in fact, you have weaved in uh, very effectively some of the uh, core points that Sabrina Mahfouz and Vikram Ayanga were also raising as to look within, why do we do what we do? What is the rationale for this self-destruction? And if we are going to look for solutions at the end of the day, the buck stops with us. 
Um, at least that is what I am picking up from your uh, intervention so far. So thank you very much for that. And I would like to now uh, invite Dr. Salim al to um, join us in this uh, panel discussion. And with your vast experience and understanding of this area, if you could perhaps bring in your perspectives and uh, share with us where, where we go from here. Thank you very much, Faustina. Uh, let me uh, thank the organizers for inviting me. So I had prepared some remarks about you know, the link between water and climate change. But after hearing the previous speakers, I'm, I'm more inclined to speak from my, my heart on, in terms of this. And, and Aaron's already said a lot of the things I was going to say with regards to connecting water with uh, the climate change issue. Uh, I just want to add a little bit to that, which is that if you're familiar with uh, uh, climate change, there are two aspects of it. One is the cause of it, which comes from the burning of fossil fuels and emissions of greenhouse gases. And what we need to do there is to reduce that. Uh, we call it mitigation in climate change uh, jargon. Uh, and a large part of that is to do with the energy sector. So we use fossils like coal and, and natural gas and petroleum very much to give us energy. And so on the mitigation side, energy is to climate change, what I would say on the impact side, water is to climate change. The impacts of climate change cut across water from the melting of the ice sheets to expansion of the ocean, uh, to floods in one place and droughts in other places, to changes in quality of salinity in the low-lying coastal zones, including here in my country in Bangladesh. Water permeates the impacts of climate change everywhere. It's, it's, it touches everybody, it, it affects everybody. And so going forward, I'll say three things and link it up, I hope, uh, to the previous speakers and to you, Faustina, as well. Uh, firstly, all of us, every single citizen of planet Earth needs to be thinking as a citizen of planet Earth and not just a citizen of our own city or our own country. That, that is now an old way of thinking. We are connected. Uh, if, if you needed anything to show it, the COVID-19 has shown it. You cannot put borders and, and stop it from coming. It's going to come. It has come. It is affecting everybody. And uh, unless everybody is uh, safe, nobody is safe. Although, as Aaron just said, the G7 leaders seem to have just totally ignored that in their uh, communique and their decision uh, just um, a few days ago. Uh, so all of us need to take this seriously. All of us need to come up to speed. All of us need to think, what can I do? And then do something. The second thing is uh, in terms of, I would say, a generational change. Uh, I see a very big distinction between the younger generation all over the world and the older generation. Uh, in fact, uh, as you know, and my apologies to the organizers, I was a bit late joining uh, because I was on, on another call with a bunch of uh, parliamentarians from the German parliament, the Bundestag, uh, who wanted to know about Bangladesh and then what I would advise them. And I said, I advise you, don't, don't listen to me, Bangladeshi. Listen to your own children and your grandchildren. They are telling you every day, every Friday, they are coming out and telling you what to do. Listen to them because you are responsible for the world that you are going to leave behind for them and you are ruining that world. And so you need to take that seriously. You don't have to listen to people thousands of miles away whom you are also affecting, but you don't want to care about them, but do care about your own children and grandchildren and do something. And so I feel that this generational aspect of it is something that we also need to think about. And I hope young people on this uh, uh, meeting, on this call, on this webinar, on this discussion, will take this forward. I see them doing it every day all over the world and every Friday in particular all over the world. That's something we need to be uh, encouraging, associating ourselves with, uh, enabling them to get their voices heard and decision makers taking them seriously. I think they are by far more important than the scientists. You know, I've been a scientist for the last 30 years. Nobody listens to me seriously. They do listen, but they don't do a damn thing. Let them listen to the kids and let's, let us get the kids to be our vanguard. And then thirdly and finally, on the topic of water, coming back to that, uh, it is really a human right, uh, Faustina. This is, you know, we are 
depriving and going to deprive millions of people of their rights to water, which is absolutely a fundamental human right. And we cannot take that lightly. We all need to be taking that seriously, whether we're a lawyer like yourself or a decision maker, uh, or, or as I said, an ordinary citizen. This is something that is fundamental to every human being on the planet. And I feel very strongly that everybody, including artists, and I'm very glad that artists are getting involved, need to be the ones that speak to the rest of the world in a way that we scientists are unable to do. I'm afraid our, our language is too jargon ridden uh, for the average person to uh, understand. And I, I feel that limitation a lot myself. So I hope I can inspire some artists to uh, take the baton and, and reach the public in a way that we scientists have not been able to. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Salim ul -Haq. I don't know if you realized it, but uh, your uh, opening remarks have also worked as a provocation. You have brought in the generational aspect and uh, that in many ways uh, requires each of us to stand before the mirror and say, what have I done today? And what can I do? What, where do I go? And how do I look my children and grandchildren in the eye and uh, uh, say that I have, behaved uh, and uh, taken decisions responsibly. Um, I would like to uh, take a minute to perhaps go into the Q&A uh, chat box. But uh, as I go through them, I would also like to request uh, all our panelists to perhaps come back with uh, maybe a, an incisive example or, or precise example or illustration. Wherever you are situated, in whichever discipline or field that you are, if there is one aspect or one area where you feel an intervention would help shift the dial. Sorry to, to you know, put you on the spot there if I have, but I am sure this is something that you think about. That, you know, if you did not have to wade through the jargon, for example, if you did not have to worry about the bureaucracy, what was the one or what is the one thing that you could or ought to have to do that could uh, take us forward. So as you are thinking, let me go through the question and answer panel and see what some of the observations are. Yes, of course, Sabrina, you've been great. Comments are coming in. Um, some are saying climate change is not about water. Climate change is about money. It is about power, control, and privilege. Another attendee said uh, that they have challenged those with power, but they get ignored and ridiculed. What are people meant to do when they get ignored? Is uh, that there is no legal drive to deal with climate change. The law is used to defend those in power, to maintain power. And the last comment is that I am a Bangladeshi living in the UK for the last 20 years. I have a question regarding the right to have water for everyone in Bangladesh. This is Samira Alam. Uh, Samira, if you don't mind, I would expand your question uh, to, uh, to make it more a global question as to the right to drink uh, or access to drinking water. Not just a need, but a right, and not just in Bangladesh, but uh, globally. So thank you. Uh, Aaron, if you could come in with your uh, answer to that question and uh, I will go to the rest of the panel, whoever wants to take that question from Samira. Thank so, you. So, so I think uh, it goes back to what Gandhi said, uh, you know, first they ignore you, uh, th then they try and laugh at you, and then, and then they uh, try and uh, fight you, right? And then you win. <laughs> so uh, I, th I think we have to recognize that this is a struggle and, and um, if, we're, if we are being ignored, then we should turn up the volume and be more disruptive. Uh, and, and then that, that's what I would suggest. But we have to do this together as a collective response, a collective struggle, um, and not on our own in isolation. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, uh, Aaron, if you could please hold on. Uh, there is another question for you. Maybe this is a counter provocation. Uh, someone is interested to know why you think that the crisis has not been a higher priority for governments or artists in their work over the recent years. It's a really good question. Um, I think there's lots of reasonable answers you could give to that question. Um, 
I would probably put a lot of focus on the power of vested interests and fossil fuel industry in particular. They have funded a very slick and very effective misinformation campaign, uh, which has been spread throughout uh, the media, uh, which has led to the public being very confused and uh, uh, unsure as to what's really happening and to how serious the, the impacts are. Um, they have also spent mil hundreds of millions of dollars lobbying politicians, uh, buying campaign adverts to elect climate denying uh, uh, elect, uh, um, uh, representatives who then won't act on the crisis. Uh, it is simply that we have now have got the corporate capture of our democratic systems in, in Western nations by these uh, massive fossil fuel interests. And I think it's only gonna be a popular um, mass movement uh, such as the students, such as uh, Extinction Rebellion in the UK, Sunrise Movement in the United States, who um, can confront that power. And so that's that's why I think we haven't taken nearly enough action so far. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for taking this. And um, there are others who also agree with you. For example, Carius Ellery Evans from Wales uh, reminds us to take a look at Wales, where water has always been a source of power, but they feel that this is a power that has been taken away from the Welsh. So um, thank you for that uh, response. If I could now come back to the rest of the panel members and uh, let's see how you feel about some of the questions that have been raised. I see Dr. Salim ul -Haq. I agree with Aaron. I just want to make, make one comment on that. And do call me Salim, by the way. Um, I. I think you know a very good example of this capture of the political system uh, at the global level by these vested interests was the last four years in the United States of America, where Mr. Trump was literally bought by the coal industry. They financed him to run, and he just did their bidding, particularly the removal of the U.S. from the Paris Agreement. You can't get any more stark example of the corruption of the political elite of the biggest country, most powerful country, the richest country in the whole world. They couldn't stand up to. Fortunately, now he's been a, a, a elected out and we have Biden. And even in the case of Biden, if you look at his politics and his uh, 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 platform when he ran, he wasn't strong on climate change, but it was the young voters who made him change his mind. And he has now become strong on climate change. That's not his personal preference. He was forced to do that by the voters, by the young people, by the Democrats in his party. So we have to keep on giving pressure. We cannot give up uh, just because they aren't listening today. We make them listen tomorrow and we don't give up. Persistence is an extremely important attitude here and solidarity across borders. If we do it all on our own in one country, we're not going to be successful. But if we join hands across the world, we can be successful tomorrow, if not today. Mm -hmm. And so if I can also take that question on the, the rights to water with a Bangladeshi perspective and a global one as well, you quite rightly said, Faustina, that the right to water is a universal right. Whether you live in Bangladesh or you live in India or you live in Wales or in the UK, everybody needs to have that right to at least drinking water, other forms of water as well, but drinking water, clean drinking water. And in Bangladesh, in the coastal zone of Bangladesh, if you and I were to visit there today, people are drinking salty water. It'll taste salty to you because of the salinity intrusion into the groundwater and the surface water systems there. And many people are uh, forced to uh, drink that water. If you're healthy, it doesn't really matter. But if you have problems, and particularly pregnant women, for them, it causes them to have uh, high blood pressure, which can lead to preeclampsia. And they need no not to have to drink uh, uh, salt water. And people are putting in rooftop rainwater harvesting as a means of adaptation to be able to get fresh drinking water, at least during the, uh, the lean season when there are no rains. Um, and so, you know, we have to adapt, we have to do what we can, but water is the universal link between everyone on the planet and the link to climate change. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, uh, that response. I think that, uh... <sighs> fills a blank in the, in the discussion that we've been having in bringing in the rights-based perspective. Um, there is a follow-up question, which in a way links up to what uh, you, uh, Salim and uh, Aaron have been uh, taking up so far. 
Uh, and this is a question about hope. And what does off water offer us as a means to transition into a future we want? So in terms, of course, there are other resources, but what role does water play into taking us into that future? Does anyone want to? I'll just say something um, quickly on that, just in terms of the research that I was doing for the play, and this is very area specific, but I think it probably applies to all colonized areas of the world, hydropolitics and, and sorting out problems that had primarily come from the way borders had been drawn during colonial times, and then the sharing of those water resources, the countries realizing that they had to overcome certain political problems in order to find solidarity on water terms um, is, is quite a far hope, but it is a little glimmer of hope that actually water is such an important resource that it can in some, in some ways overpower some of the more negative um, infighting that people may be doing in a region and force them to collaborate, force them to find solidarity. And by doing that, it might actually and bring them to a more peaceful future. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, while you were speaking, uh, Sabrina, we and uh, panelists, we've uh, received another question, and this is from David Bailey. He states that a lot of companies and large organizations release statements stating that they are aimed to become neutral, et cetera, et cetera, by, for example, instance 2015. Can you provide any clarification as to how far these statements are true or if they are just co-opting these concerns for their own PR purposes, misleading consumers, and in reality, they are doing nothing? Shall I kick off and then maybe others can join? <laughs> Good. So, yes, um, there's going to be a lot of gamesmanship here, as, as Aaron and I pointed out there are vested interests who are going to fight it all the way, particularly the fossil fuel companies. Then there are other companies that are trying to join the bandwagon without actually doing anything, you know, greenwashing themselves, claiming that they are doing things when they're not. And that we have to be very careful about. And this bandwagon jumping of going zero by 2050 is a very good example of you know, 2050 is way beyond any of us are going to be alive. So it's a, it's a good promise to make. It's not one you need to keep. So you need to ask, okay, if that's your aim by 2050, what's your aim by 2030? And that really will give you the, the difference between how serious they are. And this goes for countries as well. If countries are also declaring net zero by 2050, 2060. And those, those dates are, nice, but they don't mean anything. Um, we really need the short-term dates uh, to know by what time, by 2030, how much will they actually reduce? So we need to hold them to account, absolutely. Absolutely, it's, you know, being much more strategic in holding our, our leaders and uh, our representatives to account. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple more questions and I will uh, take them up. However, I would also, uh, I'm mindful of the time, we have another five minutes to go. Uh, I would like to ask all of our panelists to perhaps you know, think of perhaps one takeaway point that you would like to leave uh, attendees and myself with that we can uh, take away from this panel uh, session and can think about and perhaps work towards. As you are thinking of your, um, Take away point. I would like to read the last. Oh, actually, there are more questions for Vikram and Sabrina. One attendee would like to hear more from Vikram and Sabrina as to what are the challenges for the two of you and other artists in responding to the climate crisis. So, this is one. And the second is that do either of you, Vikram or Sabrina, agree that your work needs to address a crisis in the future? Is it possible to make work about anything other than the climate crisis and its politics in the future without being negligent? I hope you've got the question. Would you like me to read it out again? Uh, Vikram, we haven't heard from you in a, in a while. So do you want to go ahead first? 
Um, sure, I'd just like to pick up a couple of uh, points first. Um, I think uh, Dr. Hakki mentioned solidarity. Um, and I'll connect this to uh, um, how I'd like to answer the question that's been put to Sabrina, Sabrina and me. Um, uh, I think um, doing, um, being in solidarity with others who are working um, on the climate question is of course uh, vital, but I think we need to also be much more aware of the larger picture. Um, for me, uh, I really believe that the climate crisis is not an environmental crisis at all. It is a crisis of lifestyle. It is a crisis of the world that we have created with, it has with, with the politics and the social concerns and the, uh, and all the isms that should not be there. Um, so, uh, how do we stand in solidarity with other related movements? For example, in India now, over the last couple of years, um, we've been overrun with on the ground movements from uh, farmer protests. Students are protesting in universities across India. Um, uh, and they're all protesting against really draconian uh, laws and oppressive laws that this regime is bringing in. Um, and you cannot divorce um, the climate crisis from things like that. You cannot divorce the climate crisis from regressive agricultural laws. You can't. Um, and you have to sort of be able to connect the dots. And perhaps in connecting the dots, you also start pulling in people who may not see their role in, uh, in the climate uh, agenda or in the climate situation, but do see their role in some other political realm or some other social realm. And when, when we start connecting those dots um, for them, uh, for others to sort of find a, a geographical space within the whole bigger picture, maybe that makes it easier for more people to get involved and more people to actually demand action. Um, so I think the solidarity needs to be much larger. And I think in, that also answers the question about is there, a, can we make artistic work about anything else apart from the climate crisis in the future? Um, the climate crisis, as I said, is not, does not stand apart from everything else that we need to be worried about. It's an expression of all everything else that we are, of all the other issues that we are creating and have been creating over the last 200 years. Um, so um, I think, I, I think if one thinks broad enough, then, then all these interconnections are possible. So if I'm making an artistic work, which is maybe something to do with a very tiny family situation somewhere, there is a way of extrapolating it into, into the larger questions of climate or politics or, or whatever it is. So that, that would be my take on Sabrina. Thank you, Sabrina. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I personally don't feel like it's difficult because every single piece of art I've ever made, um, if it's set in this world, has incorporated the climate crisis into it in some way. And as Vikram's just said, everything is interconnected. I think the problem is allowing people to see how interconnected the climate crisis is into every single aspect because people just take away different things from stories, um, the things they want to take away, even if you are trying to push for a certain thing to be taken away. If it's too um, explicit, sometimes that art doesn't doesn't work in the way that you wanted it to. So it's how do you maintain the subtlety whilst also um, asking people to, to really be very aware of how everything is interconnected and linked. Um, I think that that's the main thing. And yeah, I think anything that doesn't address the climate crisis in some way or the other is negligent in general, whether that's art, politics, um, policies at every level of society. Mm -hmm. We've come to our very last minute. If I could ask uh, Aaron Thierry and uh, Salim al -Haq to share any takeaway points that you might have, and then we will have to close the session, I'm afraid. Okay, uh, I guess very briefly, um, I was warning about the rise of authoritarianism and hatred and, and uh, closed borders, but there is a very strong counter movement to that, and that's very strong in Wales. We have seen very uh, beautiful protests around refugees welcome and um, people showing their love for the rest of humanity and, and, and being willing to be a, a kind of a country of sanctuary. So 
I think um, really what the climate crisis is asking us to do is to open our hearts and to feel the, um, the horror of what we are doing to each other and to the world uh, and to then make amends for that. And um, art, I think, is a really crucial role here in, in helping uh, do that and, and helping us connect our hearts to what's going on and then using that to, to fuel us in, in, in our uh, commitment to create change. And I'll hand over to Dr. Hood. Thank you very much, Great. Aaron and, and uh, Faustina. So I, I'll actually build on Aaron's uh, comment and, and repeat what I said at the beginning. In my view, what climate change as a framing argument does, <clears throat> it makes us, each one of us, think of ourselves as citizens of planet Earth first. It's a planetary problem. It's a global problem. Nobody is in isolation here. And taking that into consideration, artists are the people who speak the language of humanity. They don't speak in single language. Artists are our means of communicating to everybody through their hearts, as Aaron said. So I appeal to artists to come up with ways to do this. Uh, use your art to appeal to everybody, as Aaron quite rightly said, to see the humanity in the solutions. Don't think about the problem so much. The problem is there, it's, it's obvious. But about what do we do about it and what can, can we do about it and give hope? Uh, that's what I hope you will be able to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. And as uh, uh, the moderator of this session, I must say it has been a pleasure. It's not every day that we get a chance to have you know, science and uh, the arts come together, uh, approaching uh, one, an issue that touches us and, as one humanity and one human family. So thank you, each of you, for your interventions, your participation and contribution to this important uh, dialogue, which I'm sure uh, can build on and will help to build on many, many other conversations. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to thank Vikram Iyengar, Dr. Aaron Thierry, Dr. Salimul Haq, and Sabrina Mahfouz for joining in this conversation today. And I would like to thank Change Everything organizers for inviting us to be part of this conversation. Thank you very much. Okay.